Good evening and welcome to this special edition of 2020 Friday. You and I are very glad to have you with us. Well, we have all seen the pictures. They are at once horrifying and compelling. Children wandering for days without food, their parents and grandparents terrorized by their former neighbors and driven from their homes. How can this be happening again as we near the 21st century? Yeah. Tonight, we're going to linger on the images a bit longer and try to understand the journey that created this refugee crisis in Kosovo. We've dispatched a team of reporters, led by our colleague Charles Gibson, to that part of the world where tonight they will share the powerful stories that have captured the world's attention. We begin along the border of Macedonia and Kosovo, where Charles Gibson is at a refugee camp. Charlie? Hugh, Barbara, to be among these refugees, you cannot help but feel their sense of loss. So many of them lost family members, families split apart as they made the trip to the Kosovo-Macedonian border. Almost all of them lost earthly possessions as they came out of their country. They have lost the peace of mind that comes from being able to tuck a child in safely at night. I would suspect that many of them feel like this has been going on forever, but actually, the series of events that led to the construction of these camps began just two weeks ago. They have come as a tidal wave of humanity. <laughs> fleeing homes they love, the majesty of their mountainous country. But make no mistake, they have been fleeing death. What we are seeing, pure and simple, is the worst European humanitarian crisis since World War II. No one expected this. When NATO bombs began to fall 17 days ago, Kosovo's ethnic Albanians were scrambling to hoard food. They thought they'd be trapped in their homes. But their Serb government had other ideas. Buses began showing up to take them away. It was becoming clear to the Albanian citizens of Kosovo that the greatest danger was not falling from the sky. It was their own government, intent on ethnic cleansing. People are disappearing. Bodies are found in the vehicles of civilians. It means these are the people who tried to flee. People have been taken from their houses or kidnapped, and some of them being uh, shot dead or executed in front of the other family members. 70 men were said to have been massacred in Belasirk. Hundreds of thousands were fleeing to a place called Belanich. It was not until the fourth day of bombing that the first refugees arrived in Albania, 10,000, mostly women, children, and men too old to fight. They arrived saying the road was littered with corpses. My father is dead in Kosovo. I saw him killed. I saw them all killed. The situation was very badly. They thrown us out with guns, machine guns, soldiers which here is some policia. Look at the numbers. Since those first refugees arrived at Kosovo's borders just two weeks ago, about 300,000 have been forced out into Albania, 130,000 to Macedonia, another 60,000 to Montenegro. The numbers are anything but exact, but that is just under half a million people, and makeshift camps have been thrown up overnight to receive them, camps that were hardly adequate. We have no water, no bread, we don't know where we're going. The camps in Macedonia, for example, got overwhelmed. Those strong enough to fight for food, fought. Those who couldn't made do with what was left. 65,000 were stranded in this camp in Blache alone. People talked of it as a valley of death. Just this past Tuesday in the middle of the night, Macedonian forces cleared out Blache overnight. They moved so quickly that people left behind essentials like baby food, pictures. One man had gone to get bread for his family. When he returned, they were gone. This child is separated from his family, and so is this five-year-old. Hopefully we're going to find her parents, so um, all will be well in the end. Some of the refugees are being shipped out. Norway, Germany, Turkey. But most want to stay, not because they like the camps. There is little to like when Macedonian guards keep them behind barbed wire. No, they want to stay because it's the closest they can be to home. Hope is maybe the last thing that dies. But this looks like a long fight, 
a long time away from home. And that has become such a precious word for this tidal wave of humanity, home. Home for now for the refugees in Macedonia is a tent, a blanket, and the clothes on their back. And that is not much to keep spirits up. The refugee camp at Brajda, set up on an airstrip just across the Macedonian border with Kosovo. 20,000 inhabitants. But when you look at the sprawl of tents, the endless sea of white, you figure there have to be more. This is the story of just one of those tents, Tent 719, so named by the families who live there. Three families, 13 people in one tent. To find it, go seven tents down the main road, turn and count. 15, 16, 17, 18, 18 over this here. Is one. And play is ours. And so Incredible to say, but these families are lucky in some ways. They're together. So many families have been separated. These refugees have spent days searching for their missing family members. In tent 719, they do little each day but survive. They have no beds, no padding, one thin blanket per person for the cold nights. And hardest of all, they have no idea how long they'll be here. It is hard for Americans to imagine being refugees. Hard to imagine having just a few hours to clear out or risk being killed in your own home. But that's what happened to the families of Tent 719. Families that are really just like yours and mine. Families that until a week and a half ago had kids home watching MTV and surfing the internet on Yahoo.com. I did not believe that. Somehow I believe that nothing will happen to us. Shpend Barkali, Ekrem Messimi, and Tomor Rudi were friends and neighbors in the Kosovo capital of Pristina. With NATO airstrikes underway and the Serbs moving against ethnic Albanians, Tomor got a late night phone call from a Serb friend. Get out of your houses, he said. Gunmen would be there in the morning. The three families were terrified. To think, okay, you go for food, you go to collect the clothes, I will have computer, you go to hide uh, expensive things, here, there, here, there, where to hide, and like that, my father started to collect uh, photos. The photos show Tomor, his family and friends, in happier times. His father hid the pictures in some clothes he had packed, then opened a last bottle of expensive wine. It was 1 a.m. My father said, okay, let's toast for coming back very soon and have a normal life. At sunrise, with villages burning across Kosovo, Serb military forces showed up, as predicted. The police broke out, broke out the door of the house, entered in in a mask, uh, in uniforms and mask, and they put the guns to the babies and told them to, to give money to them, all the money they have. And then, along with thousands of civilians, the three families were herded to the railway station and packed, crushed, into train cars. Parents were separated from children and each other. There was massive panic. Oh, where is my child? Where is my mom? Where is my dad? So we started. My brother, Korob, are you there? Mama, are you there? Daddy, okay? Everything okay? Ah, ah. It was five hours on the train before it even began to move. And then a seven-hour journey and they weren't entirely sure where they were going. They arrived at a place called Blache on the Macedonian border. The world referred to it as a no man's land. But the refugees had a simpler term. It is a real hell. The one who hasn't experienced that doesn't know what I'm talking. But I, I, I will try to explain you and to describe the situation down there. Uh, we have already called and named it the Valley of Death. Uh, we were treated uh, like some kind of, I don't know, animals. Uh, we, it was a battle for survival. There were five days in Blache, five miserable days. It was rain, I mean even nature wa wasn't in our side. I saw mud everywhere, every kind of trash, smell, and I, I began to cry. I, I began to cry. But they survived it, 
and were relocated just this past Tuesday to Brajda, tent 719. And life, as it does, quickly settled into routine, the routine of survival. Well, after the cold night, I mean the nights are very cold here, I wake up, I go to the man's room, let me say, because it's not a water closet. The latrines are just holes in the ground, filled in each night and moved to minimize smell. There is no privacy. The lines for food can take three or four hours. And Tomor told me that back home in Pristina, he used to volunteer to aid refugees. And he notes the irony. Now he is one. Tomar is most proud of the fact before he was forced from his home, he dismantled his computer and smuggled out the critical parts. No Serb, he vowed, would ever get to use it. I cannot take a gun and go in KLA because I'm not a guy like that. I can do this. I can work with computer. What to do if he came in, he will not manage to work with my computer because I don't want it. It's mine. These camps are only designed, really, as temporary refuge. Two weeks, three, no longer. But they may have to last a good bit longer. It is sunset at tent 719. Another night. There is no electricity. The candle is getting short. But the night and the days to come are going to be long. And word came just today that the UN refugee chief has advised NATO governments to hold off on plans for airlifting thousands of refugees to the West, saying it's best for the time being for them to remain close to Kosovo. You know, sometimes it's hard to look beyond the current plight of the refugees, but here's something to think about. Until just a few weeks ago, there was some normal life in Kosovo. Men and women shopping for food at a local market. Children playing a game of basketball. Teenagers that looked like our own. There were men and women walking to and from their jobs in the city and stopping for a shoe shine. This is the way things were in some communities in Kosovo. Something else to think about. Up until recently, most of us didn't even know where Kosovo was. In a moment, you'll find out how all the hate began. We have seen their stricken faces, and it's not the first time we've seen such horror in this part of the world. Not too long ago, we saw it in Bosnia. But it's still very difficult to understand how did this all begin? Where does this hatred come from? Watch, and you'll understand. Kosovo. An area smaller than New Jersey, with a population of less than 500,000, about as many people as New Orleans, was up until recently populated mostly by people of Albanian descent. Now, as you know, most of them have been driven out by the Serbs, led by Yugoslav President Milosevic. The mutual hatred between Serbs and Albanians fueling this tragedy has been festering for centuries. For Serbs, Kosovo is the Holy Land, where medieval Serbian kings once ruled, and where important shrines of the Serbian Orthodox Christian Church still stand. 600 years ago, in 1389, a battle was fought in this place near Kosovo, called the Field of Blackbirds. There, the Muslim Turks defeated the Christian Serbs. Ever since, the Serbs have called Kosovo the Grave of Our Liberty and Serbian myths compare the battle lost in this field to the crucifixion of Christ. After World War II, Kosovo became a part of communist Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito. And in Kosovo itself, the Albanians ran the local government. What people may not realize today is that the Serb minority was persecuted. And in the 1980s, rioting and violence by ethnic Albanians drove some 20,000 Serbs out of Kosovo, the reverse of what we're seeing today. On April 24, 1987, a then unknown communist official named Slobodan Milosevic came to Kosovo and listened to Serbian complaints of persecution at the hands of the Albanians. <laughs> His response triggered a militant nationalism in the Serbs. No one should dare beat you, no one, he said. In 1989, 
on the 600th anniversary of the battle lost to the Turks, Milosevic went back to the field of the Blackbirds and made a speech that tapped into ancient hatred. Though Kosovo was 90% Albanian at that point, Milosevic announced that Christian Serbs would take over the schools, the police, the courts, and he ended the self-rule in the province that the majority Kosovo Albanians had long enjoyed. The Serbs were history's victims, he told the crowd. After the collapse of communism, in the early 1990s, Yugoslavia was broken up as smaller states, like Bosnia and Croatia, asserted their independence. The Serbs feared becoming just another minority, and Slobodan Milosevic has used ancient Serbian passions forged on that old battleground as a tool to strengthen his own power. And he has harnessed the anger of defeat centuries old to justify driving out their historic enemies, the Albanians. This is called ethnic cleansing, and now he seems to be succeeding in doing just that. It is one thing to talk about ethnic cleansing and quite another to put a human face on it. ABC's Sheila McVicker is along the border of Kosovo and Albania, where refugees have told her what can only be described as stories from hell. In the hospital morgue of the Albanian border town of Kukes, this young man mourns for his father. The Serbs were not content just to force the Bayat family out of Kosovo. They tortured the young man first. And as a result of witnessing that, the shock, the stress, his father died. They did everything they wanted to me. Nothing worse can happen to a woman. 19-year-old Estrida Hojoy ended up in a hospital here, needing a pregnancy test. She says she was repeatedly raped by two Serb policemen who first beat a man to death in front of her. These are just two of the stories of the darkest side of the Kosovo tragedy the atrocities. Sixty international fact-finders like this man are now fanning out around Albania and Macedonia, hoping to learn enough to eventually bring the perpetrators to justice. The investigations have barely begun, but aid workers, doctors and monitors say that already they can see a pattern. What is beginning to emerge is a tale of routine mass murder, of bodies burnt to destroy evidence. And once again in the Balkans, of mass graves. One Kosovo man escaped with this videotape of one of those mass grave sites. The horror here is clear to see. Most of the rest requires little frightful imagination. We are sure that all they, they say is uh, true because uh, when they come uh, in their eyes they are very afraid and with their eyes they, they said that it's true. Anne-Marie Guillot is a doctor for the French volunteer group Médecins du Monde. She's heard countless stories in this camp in Kukes, among them a pattern of massacres involving children. They keep one person, um, often it's a child, uh, not killed, uh, so he can see everything and he can tell us what happens. <laughs> That's what happened to this 10-year-old boy. Madri's whole family was killed, some shot, all left inside when the house was torched to the ground. The boy was spared, but not before taking a bullet that shattered his shoulder. His arms too weak, he could not save his wounded two-year-old sister. He could hear her cries as he fled, part of the untreatable blow to his soul. The next day, when I, c I come, he was crying, and when he see sees me, he makes a big smile, and it was very good for my heart. <laughs> there are few such moments. Instead, people here speak of evil, with tales of systematic beatings, allegations of organized rape, summary executions of civilians, and ominously everywhere, do you know what happened to the people there? Stories of men being rounded up. 38 men were taken to the schoolhouse in the next village. I saw 60 men put on an army truck and driven away. But I, I can they gathered up the men, they beat them, then took them away. Most often there is nothing known, nothing certain about their fate. But what happened to this man offers a chilling clue. 
Pedrit Pasha is a survivor of one of those roundups. They said, stand against the wall with your hands behind your head and your eyes to the wall. They started shooting at us. When they finished, they closed the door and set fire to the house. He believes more than 100 men from his village, including his 13-year-old brother, died that day. And he also believes one of their murderers was a neighbor. Who was it that was doing this? Police, police. Regular police in regular uniforms. Were you able to see the faces of the police who did this? One, yes. He was from our village. I knew him since the day I was born. The others I don't know. They were wearing masks. That's a story we heard again and again. It seems the uniform for atrocity in Kosovo these days is just a mask. Who was it that did this to you? Could you see their faces? Yeah. Only his eyes. That will be the hard part for war crimes investigators, how to identify the perpetrators. Most often in Bosnia, the Serbs who committed atrocities did not wear masks. It seems this time they have learned their lesson. If adults are being brought to the very edge of sanity, imagine how all of this is affecting the children. When we come back, you'll meet a 13-year-old girl named Lindita, who has seen more in her short life than any teenager should ever have to see. We'll be right back. The stories that are most affecting in these refugee camps are those of the children. Sometimes it seems as if Serb paramilitary or border guards purposely split apart families. So it is not uncommon in the camps to find children alone, fending for themselves, without mothers or fathers, sisters or brothers. Dr. Nancy Snyderman, who has been in the camps this week, found two of those children. We've seen their faces every night on the news. Children numbly marching behind adults now living in tent camps pitched on the Yugoslav border. On a trek from hell to hellish uncertainty, miles from their homes and their homework. But these are not families, they're only bits and pieces. <coughs> However intact they were when they walked out of their doors in Kosovo, by the time these families reached the Serbian border, in the confusion, most had lost at least one loved one. On an everyday basis, most of us who are parents worry about things like whether daycare is traumatic for our children, whether the teenagers will come in on time. But you walk past family after family here and you realize that those concerns are almost trivial. You worry here about whether you can feed and clothe your children, whether you can keep them dry, whether you can even find them. And that's a central issue because I have yet to meet one family that's been left intact. Diana Barisha Mahmoudi works with UNICEF, one of four organizations trying to reunite mothers and fathers with their children. With tens of thousands of people wandering in these camps, the process is overwhelming. They can only go one name at a time. No one knows how many children are lost. The aid agencies can't even get a handle on it. You have two kids, and they are in Skopje. He lost them 12, 12, day, 12 days ago. For many, this process is too slow and uncertain. They don't want to wait. The name of my, my son. Hussein hasn't seen his 12-year-old son in three days. This is a trauma no parent imagines ever facing. But adults know how to ask for help, even in a makeshift bureaucracy. What do you do if you're just a kid? Lindita is 13 years old, and she is all by herself. Two weeks ago, she watched her brother die after a Serb shell blasted the second floor of her house. A few days later, her family and neighbors fled their village and headed for the Macedonian border. Half her family in the car, Lindita and her mother joining others on a tractor. So those of you who are on the tractor ended up near Skopje? Yes, here at the border they separated us. My aunt and I managed to get in the bus, but there was no more space for the others. The driver closed the door and he said there will be another bus coming to pick them up. My mother and my sister remained outside. 
Lindita was left with only the clothes on her back. Her bus brought her here to Stankovitz, along with thousands of others. She is with her uncle and aunt, but she has seen no one else from her village. Life without her parents has forced her to fend for herself. When so much has happened to such a young girl, is there time to stop and just cry, or do you just stay strong all the time? I think about it all the time, but what is there to be done? I'm not the only one. It is no easy task for the aid agencies that are scrambling to collect the names of all these children and match them. Lindita must wait. She is one of many. Adelina Barisha is 10 years old. She too has lost her parents. I was in the woods and they just shot at me. They had machine guns. I didn't know my way. Some of these kids have had tremendous traumatic experiences. I mean, they've seen people being killed, they've been wounded themselves. And they obviously, many of them display all the regular symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Runis Stuvland, a trauma psychologist, studies the emotional scars of children during wartime. They will report severe sleep problems, they cannot fall asleep, they wake up, they have nightmares. They repeatedly see and see what has happened. You can ask them and they will say, it's like I have a camera in my head, they will say, I see everything happening again. I think for many people at the camp now and these small children, I think they're just wondering what's happening to them and what has happened to the whole adult world, if you like, because everything has just fallen apart. But children are resilient, even in the midst of chaos. Order starts to reestablish itself, new ways to play. I miss my school. When the teacher told me there will be no more school, I cried. Adelina, the little girl who was shot in the back, was luckier than most. She was just reunited with her mother. Lindita is not there yet, but she's closer. Using our phone, she was able to contact a family friend in London. Her parents are alive but it will be days before she knows where they are. I feel much better, much relieved, and I would like to be reunited with my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters. What's the first thing you're going to say to your mother and father when you see them? I would say, thank God we are together. For the adults who are in these camps, well, you hope it's just a small part of their lives. But for the children, well, the worry is that they'll be traumatized for the rest of theirs. Hugh? Charlie, we keep reminding ourselves that these are just children whose silent eyes have seen the inexplicable and whose small feet have carried them on a treacherous journey to the squalor and uncertainty of tomorrow. I was struck by a picture I saw yesterday in the New York Times. This young boy from Kosovo traveled for a week with his family to reach a refugee camp in Duras, Albania. When he finally arrived, he was so wearied and weakened, he couldn't lift the bread that relief workers had given him to his mouth. The journey had exhausted him. It's a dramatic picture of a little boy, now a nameless refugee. But who is he and how exactly did he get there? We don't know. We only know that he ended up in Albania, part of a stream of almost 300,000 refugees that have flooded the country. The largest single concentration of those refugees is now in Kukas. That's a 50-mile journey from Pristina. It's a tough trek, especially for children. How can any of them make it? When we come back, an incredible story of survival, how one extended family is staying together and alive, plus a very special message for a brother in the United States. We'll be right back. It may be hard to believe, but the refugees who have made it into the camps are the lucky ones. Thousands of others are living in improvised makeshift camps they set up on their own, living in the back of trucks with no services and only a few scattered relief workers available to help. From Albania, John Quinones has their story. 
Just a few days ago, this was the tragic scene at Kukas, Albania, the tiny village that sits near the border with Kosovo, as 300,000 refugees fled for their lives. But this is the border crossing at Kukas today. It's eerily quiet. Three days ago, the Albanian government closed it down. 20,000 refugees who were waiting to get in from the other side have disappeared. No one knows where they've gone. The result, entire families, tens of thousands of them, have been split apart. I left my whole family in Kosovo. I have no idea what's happened to them. I don't even know if they're dead or alive. 14-year-old Mihadina is one of the many thousands now living in tents, on the backs of tractors, or under the cover of sticks and plastic in this makeshift refugee camp. This morning, they woke up to temperatures in the 30s. It was cold and wet. And yet their tales of terror make this miserable camp seem comforting. In Kosovo, they have killed our people and they have burned down our homes. The grenade just kept raining down right on top of us. Every one of these refugees tells a story of atrocity at the hands of Serbian forces. From the men who say they were beaten mercilessly with rifle butts and shovels, to the 80-year-old woman hit by an exploding grenade, to the 14-year-old boy who says he was beaten by police and is alive today thanks to his grandmother. The policemen were pulling him one way and I was pulling him another. Then they started beating him on the head. They got away, she says, only when another police officer stepped in. He said, come on, quick, hurry, go. What do you think President Milosevic and his government are trying to do here? Clean us all out. There will be nobody left. Families on a desperate search for refuge. Listen to the story of Ahmed Tachi. He and his wife and their two children and a large extended family led a comfortable middle-class life in a farming village in Kosovo. Last Thursday morning, the family was at home when word spread through their village that the Serbs were about to attack. In his old tractor, he loaded his wife, his two children, and his paralyzed mother. We carried what we could, like you see, for example, this. I carried this and threw it in. Next, I got bread and threw that on as the tractor was driving away. Their home and their entire village were burned to the ground. And then, halfway through their four-day trek to Albania, Ahmed was detained by the Serb police, he says, and then the beating started with a shovel and an iron rod. Where? I was hit on my head, on my arm as I was trying to protect myself, on my back and on my legs. Ahmed is 52 years old and typical of most of the males in this camp. Very few young men have made it out of Kosovo. What do you miss most about home? My father. The fathers of each one of these little girls are missing, and so are the husbands of so many young mothers. They were killed, kidnapped, in hiding, or fighting with rebel forces somewhere in Kosovo. Many women told us they have been separated from the husband, and the husband were taken. Laura Baldrini is a spokeswoman for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. This is a big concern for them, and also for us, for UNHCR here, because, uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, we, we can just uh, imagine what can happen to those men. This man told us the only ones left are us and them, the old and the very young. It's been more than two weeks since the bombing started in Kosovo, just across those mountains. Two weeks since this massive exodus of humanity began. But because of the isolation of this little corner of northern Albania, Humanitarian relief has just now started to trickle in. So despite the millions of dollars in aid donated by foreign countries, the only relief these people have seen is a spot on the ground, some bread and water. The meager offerings are handed out three times a day. But all of the refugees we spoke with say their families need much more. Look, just bread. That's all we get. Sometimes we just put a little salt on it. We can't eat it anymore. It's no wonder that everyone we spoke to wants to go back home to Kosovo. I just want to go back to Kosovo as soon as possible.
Even if your home is not there? Yes, even if there's nothing there. I will sleep in the backyard if I have to. Everybody wants to go home. Everybody asks us, when can we go home? And we have no answer. In the meantime, the refugees are being moved from camp to camp, often not ever being told where they're headed. And yet, despite all the uncertainty, there is no doubt here as to how they feel about NATO's bombing of their homeland. The NATO bombs are just fine, he says. In fact, if there were ground troops involved, it would be all the better. Finally, we were asked to deliver one more message from this rain-soaked camp in northern Albania. A message from Ahmed Tachi. Three of his brothers are missing in the midst of the bombing. As it turns out, he has a fourth brother in Chicago. I just want to tell him that we're all okay, he says. We made it out alive. Well, Ahmed gave us the name of his brother in Chicago. After a little detective work, we were able to find him. And just this morning, we brought our videotape to his home. There, for the first time in two years, Yusuf laid eyes on his brother and heard his message. And this is what he told us. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to, to when you, <clears throat> you see from here and, and uh, how they live. It's hard for them and hard for me too, you know. It's... That is hard. In a moment, some moving thoughts. A reporter's notebook from our Jim Wooten when we come back. One of our ABC News colleagues, Jim Wooten, was reporting from Kosovo before the air attacks began and continued to cover the story after the bombing started. To get some sense of how you feel when you cover a story that has human tragedy like this, we asked Jim to put his thoughts into words, because he does that about as well as anyone. <laughs> These are called the Mountains of the Dam, an altogether appropriate setting for this misery, this suffering, this, this evil. The reality is unreal, the truth unbelievable. It is a story beyond telling that must be told, for this is history, a dreadful, disastrous history rolling through the Mountains of the Damned already written on the desperate faces of all these people. Look at them. Look at him. Look at her. An ancient lady, stooped by the weight of her years, has no idea where she is or why she is where she is. And this old woman, crammed by Serb police like luggage into the trunk of a stranger's car, in this madding crowd, she is all alone. It is not possible for a journalist to see this, to be inside it, enveloped by it, and then simply walk away from it, unchanged, uninvolved, unmoved. And yet there is a sense of helplessness for a reporter as well, and a sad certainty that because the pictures all look much the same, their force will be diminished, and no one will care. But a quarter of a million people, homeless, hopeless, driven from their country into Europe's poorest country, jammed into crowded camps, cannot be ignored. Nor can their memories. The tales of terror they're eager to tell are, like the pictures, remarkably similar. Yugoslav soldiers, Serb police, ultra-nationalist paramilitary thugs and thieves went on a murderous but a well-planned and well-coordinated rampage in Kosovo. In village after village and town after town, they herded the people into the streets. They killed those who were reluctant to leave. They separated the men from the women. They marched them separately to collection points. They stole their cars and their money. They burned their houses behind them, took their identity papers, and forced them toward the border, shooting those who strayed from the road. Those who made it ended up in places like this. 
Everything is burned, he says. It's all burned down, everything. Whoever they were, whatever they were, that's all gone now. And what will happen to them now? I don't know. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> to try to make a life out of nothing. I hope it's all of this is some kind of dream. <laughs> it is a dream, in a sense, a nightmare for her and for all of them. These strangers in a strange land, relying now on the kindness of strangers. So this is a tiny slice, a small impression, nothing more, of a vast and vile story that can't really be told. All the more incredible because what has happened here, all this savage cruelty, this primitive brutality inflicted on these people, all this has happened about 300 miles from the piazzas of Rome, less than two hours by air from the boulevards of Paris. And all this has happened at the very dawning of the 21st century. This is a new heart of darkness, but it is still madness. Madness. It is madness indeed. We'll be right back. Once again, Charles Gibson joins us from a refugee camp along the border of Kosovo and Macedonia. Charlie? Hugh, Barbara, we go away, but these people stay for the indefinite future. And so many of them worry, not just about getting back to Kosovo again, but also about ever finding their family members. It really breaks your heart. We want to thank all the ABC News personnel who were such a help while we were here, and you have to salute the international aid workers who do such a terrific job under such difficult circumstances. Good night, Barbara. Good night, Charlie, and thank you. And there are an awful lot of relief agencies doing good work over there, among them the Red Cross, Refugees International, Doctors Without Borders, and the International Rescue Committee. And one I know very well, UNICEF, whose mission, of course, is to help the children. If you want to help, all these agencies have toll-free numbers to call, or you can get more information about any of them through our website, abcnews.com.